Hello friends, welcome to uh, to this live recording of the Imaginary Friends Show Dirt Coop Podcast. The one true podcast on science, skepticism, religion, politics, current affairs, and a whole bunch of other stuff that we will get to very soon, I assure you. Are we recording by the way, Ross? No. Are we rolling? Yeah. <laughs> well, then I'll do that preamble again in a couple of seconds. Uh, so, guys, what, just uh, before we actually start, no, why not? Let's, no, let's do it. Let's start. Make your announcement. And then okay. So, just very quickly, um, uh, tonight's show, uh, thank you very much for, for, for coming this evening. Uh, for tonight's show, we're going to do a live recording of, of my show, the Imaginary French Show.com podcast, or Dirt Cone Podcast. Uh, on tonight's panel, we have Ross Bouch, the president of the uh, Brisbane Skeptics Society. We have uh, Nick Morgamore. He That's is, my name. It is his name. Uh, that is both technically and literally correct. Um, and uh, he's a comedian. He's a local Brisbane comedian, and he's also a regular guest on, on my show. Uh, and finally, we have, and, and thanks very much to the Atheist Foundation of Australia, uh, we have a tremendous British comedian by the name of Robin Ince. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Is this part of the David Lynch exhibition? <laughs> Which is fantastic. You, you, you went? Yeah, it was excellent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was very good. So what we're going to do this evening is we're going to start off with a, with a, uh, with a song, then we're going to record the podcast, and then we're going to finish off with a song. Um, the first song that we have is uh, is a song that we recorded for the first time, or the song that we performed for the first time uh, at the last Skepticam, uh, which was in July of last year. And it's a, it's a love song to water. And the reason for that, the reason that we wrote this song is, uh, you, you may be aware of, there's a scientist, in inverted commas, uh, who died recently, unfortunately. I take back those inverted commas. Uh, he, uh, his name was uh, Dr. Masaru Emoto, and uh, he believed, based on his uh, research, those had actual inverted commas, that water had feelings, that water had emotions. And uh, there was a story around the time of the Skeptic Camp that uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, the, uh, the movie star, etc., that, uh, that she would not talk badly to her children. She would not talk harshly to her children because there was water inside her children. And if she spoke badly to that water, that water would talk to the water that she was drinking and she would get sick. And so we wrote a love song to water. <laughs> Very nice. Okay. Back. And that's 
absolutely no sense that you feel emotion, but I think it's more likely you were smoking crack. Cause you want it, dear. You want it, dear. You don't care if I exist. But I don't care. Because I love you, dear. And my love for you persists. I want to be inside you, dear. Oh, I want you so deep inside me. Even though the more I drink of you, well, I suppose the more of you I expose is weak. I love you from that first moment on when our fates colluded to collide. Without you, oh, without you. says that you feel emotion, but I think it's more likely that he was smoking Yeah, he, uh, he, he managed to, to, to sit through the end. I think it's a form of torture that he puts himself through in these, these movies, but... Perhaps a water torture? Yeah. <laughs> but it has a thing where it's... I got the five-disc edition, which was, was likely equivalent, about $12. And it says it has a brand new technology that allows you to go through the rabbit hole and go into the film wherever you wish. It just has this incredible technology. And it does, but it's a chapter menu. <laughs> and it's, got, it, it's a great. Uh, sorry, I've started. I'll, I'll, I'll shut up a minute. But it's the. Um, Please don't. It's got this thing where uh, it does. It had, you know the bit, the bit where if you're, if you're a non scientist, they have some real science. Yeah. And, they, and you watch it, they go real science, real science. And then they jump to bullshit science. Okay. It's not science, but hopefully you don't see the crack. So they, yeah. they show you the double slit experiment. And they kind of go, you know, they're, they're showing you that. And you go, yeah, this is pretty much what contemporary physics believes about. Yeah. You know, there we go, through both slits, through neither slits, you know, all of this stuff. And, and that goes on for about 10 minutes. And then it just goes straight to Van going, and that's why the brain can time travel. And you go, hang ah, on a minute. <laughs> that, no, 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 we've missed a couple of sentences there. <laughs> well, you know, the double slit experiment is about quantum physics, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, well, so well, there was probably ten quantums involved there. Well, you just, I had you just a, missed them. I had a double slit experiment of my own, but it was nothing to do with science. So. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> It started. That's well, that's ruined the evening now, isn't it? <laughs> that's one of the jokes that Jake would cut out of the podcast if it weren't live. Did I literally just so you all know. Because we're live, yes, indeed. And so we are recording now, Ross. We are certainly Fantastic. recording. Thank you very much. Well, hello, dear listening ninjas, and welcome to this, the special episode, special live episode of the Imaginary French Show Dirt Code Podcast, the one true podcast on science, scepticism, religion, politics, current affairs, and the correct way to tie a bow tie. Which is the way that Nick tied it, and the way that I didn't tie it because I am not wearing a bow tie. Or we at least failed. Did. We yes. failed miserably at the bow tie. We failed tie. the bow tie test. Uh, In fact, mine didn't even look that good, so I'm not sure I want to tie it particularly. <laughs> it turns out sewing is not my forte. No. Was it fort? I was. Well, yeah, one of those two. It's both. Mm. First one and then the other. So. Uh, Can you do a Mobius bow tie? Uh, is there a way of doing a kind of. Is, is that where you get someone to tie it for you and then have a clip at the back because the boys know? Well, I was thinking just like kind of, so, so it's continuous, yeah, yeah there is, there is, there's only, like there's one is it possible to do that or not? Uh, I suppose we could ask uh, Chris about that, but... Uh, is Chris he's, he's, he's not here yet, is not unfortunately. Chris, Chris is our, uh, the, the, the Brisbane Skeptics Society resident, um, Bow tie. Bow tie. Hip, hipster. No, no, hipster. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. is the actual correct term. He, he is my master in the bow tie. I, uh, I am his oh, star yeah. people, I believe. Fantastic. Well, I hope uh, well, you've certainly succeeded far more than I. And since I made my own bow tie, I've worn one every single day. The same the one? The same one? Every no, no, day. I've got two now. <laughs> <laughs> you've moved on in the world. So, uh, we are in fact the one true podcast case that says, what do you call a Muslim on a plane? Oh, no. <laughs> Pilot, flight attendant, or passenger. Or, of course, you could ask them their name. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that works. You know, asking people's names. In fact, Jake, um, it, uh, it reminds me of that story of the, not, not very funny, but the, the, essentially the attack on a poor Muslim woman that you witnessed uh, a few months ago. Yeah, you want me to get into that, do you? Well, um, I, I just... Well, actually, yeah, it was... It was with, with, the, with the recent um, Restore Australia rallies and all, all mm. the nonsense, I, I think it's worth bringing up again. Yeah, actually. absolutely. Well, hey, why not? Uh, in Roma Street Station, just uh, not too far away from here, uh, across another side of the platform, I just uh, arrived on the train, the train had taken off. Uh, two platforms away from me, there was uh, unfortunately a lady wearing a hijab, uh, which is the, the, the scarf one, and uh, a bogan, a, uh, a, a human individual, a male human individual from. Um, from Queensland, unfortunately, walked up to her, ripped the headscarf off her head, which threw it to the ground, and um, you know, he ran away. So it was, uh, it was absolutely disgusting. Probably one of the, the, the worst acts that I think I've, I've ever uh, witnessed, and I've seen Nick Morgan more live. So, <laughs> uh, I, I don't want to make light, but I apologise for that. But. You, Quite seriously, it was the, one of the worst things that I've ever seen. I, I walked over to her, as did several other uh, passengers. I sprinted over. The, the guy, unfortunately, had, had gone very quickly, as cowards often do. And, um, and, and I comforted her, sat with her for a while. As many of you local residents might know, directly across the road from Roma Street Station is, a, is the local Brisbane uh, City Police Station. And I offered to walk her in and uh, provide a description of the gentleman. Um, however, she declined, and, and effectively her words were, uh, if I do that, there will be reprisals. It's probably true, and it's really unfortunate. Um, and yeah, it's sickening, and uh, this is a comedy show, and thanks very much, Ross. <laughs> <laughs> we could finish with my joke about the Reclaim Australia rally, if you like. Well, this, this would probably be the right time for things could only get better, but this is the wrong podcast. <laughs> um, did, did you hear what happened to the Muslim man who went to the Reclaim Australia rally? No. no! Neither did his family, so if you could please contact the police if you have any information, that would be very appreciative. Unfortunate, yes indeed. So I think that Bogan, as you said, was taking a bit of a risk because it's, it's not that dissimilar. Nikam and also the way a ninja dresses. So that is true. He might fuck that up. I, I, would, say, I would say, though, that this Nikab was beautiful. It's uh, as they often are. Sorry, the... Uh, the the hijab is the scarf, yeah, yeah, yeah. from memory, yeah. So the, the, she was wearing the, the, yeah, the, the hijab, and it was, it was beautiful, yeah. So yeah, no, but, I wouldn't mistake it for But, a, but for still, a like, he could have just been a fabulous ninja. I mean, yeah, that's exactly that right. We're having yeah. a go at ninjas on this podcast. That, that is They're true. not all down dresses. That's Some true. Some of them have very look about them. That is true, and I sincerely apologise for what being mistaken by ninjas. What an anti-ninja anti ninja podcast. <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly what people told me Brisbane would be like. They're so pro ninja Perth. Yeah. <laughs> they heard of Brisbane enough to actually tell you something about it. <laughs> That's a surprise in and of itself. <laughs> Absolutely. Actually, can I do the, uh, the, the terrible customary thing and, and ask you, Robin, uh, how are you enjoying the place? Uh, do you know what? I've had a lovely time uh, because uh, I, I've had a lot of jet lag because I'm quite old. But I also have insomnia, yep. so which I always have. So it's a really nice time that I never know when I'm meant to be angry that I'm not sleeping. <laughs> and so I've generally, I'm, I'm awake. I've seen dawn in every single city that I've, I've been, and uh, I've had a great time. I really, uh, yeah. So there's no, there's no, nothing, there's no anecdotes at all. I went and did a gig, then I met some people, yeah. then I did a lot of podcasts. Yeah. You know, the Australian Atheist Foundation, they literally just put me in a room. I mean, this, I feel sort of like Patty Hearst at the moment. I've got no room, that was, most people have no idea Patty Hearst is, of course. There's a very young audience where they're going to believe that if they're listening at home, they're not going to know what you look like. So it's, uh, 
<laughs> no, I'm not, I'm, I'm like, I've, I've got on a different plate now, you know, every couple of days, and uh, it's been it's been what I've what I kind of expected because I love what I love about Australia is I think there is one I don't think you can judge people by the way they look. I think there are you know the, the people you, you mean white, right? Well, <laughs> but they're just, you can't, they're, there's lots of people who, I would think, oh, that bloke's not going to come see my show, he's got a great big handlebar moustache, he's got no sleeves or whatever, then afterwards he comes up and he's going on about how funny he found the particle physics routine, and I like that kind of thing, and also I love the fact that Australia, you know, the, the sceptic and the atheist tradition, I think is kind of, it, it's been going, it's been slightly more powerful, stronger, and more of a kind of cohesive group than I think in, in the UK, mm. and probably in the US as well. Well, just sort of following on from what you're saying, you know, the, the guy with the handlebar moustache who you're surprised to, uh, to, 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 you know, to have them come up and talk to you about. See, in, in Australia, uh, we have this thing uh, where if you are a nerd, you have to hide it. Um, so yes, uh, Nick has a nice curly moustache. I, up until this morning, had a nice thick beard, and I look tough. I look tough. I hide my nerdyism really well, really well. By tough, do you mean weathered? Yes. Weathered, that's okay. Yeah. Just, just making sure we can clarify that. <laughs> so guys, now it's time to go like... a sceptic podcast should do, we should always be clarifying. Exactly. Absolutely. It's very important to clarify. Right when I'm saying something. <laughs> so now it's time to get... trying to introduce the show. So now it's time to get... the I'll tell you what, I'm a big fan of Samuel Beckett. Let's drag this oh, out. I, can't see, I, I wanted to see him go weaving an endgame, but I can't, so let's create that over. The two of us go and sit in bins. Come on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, guys, now it's time to analyse the statements of religious, conservative, and otherwise strangely interesting individuals from around the world who totally, completely, and utterly demonstrate their sanity, relative intelligence, and indeed consistency with reality. So first up, during the Senate inquiry into taxation of multinationals in Australia, the Green Senator Christine Milne asked Tony King, a representative from Apple, and I should say Tony King, uh, the representative from Apple, looks like somebody who's had his face surgically altered to be happy. He's got one of these plastered on smiles, it's amazing. Cool like you, Mike. <laughs> Is that like that kind of? Because I, I watched Going Clear the other day, and yes, uh, exactly. Not in Australia, because that's illegal. Yes. And by the way, I've, I've, I've never seen uh, Dallas Buyers Club in this country. Just <laughs> here as well. the, um, but you watch uh, Tom Cruise, and he never laughs happily. He goes. <laughs> Everyone's gonna die. He has that laugh <laughs> that is like a kind of a, a dictator imagining everyone ruined. It. So yeah. when he's at his most joyous, all you see in his eyes is death. Yes. <laughs> or abyss. That's his. That's his soul. That's what you yeah. see. It's the death of his of his soul, dying slowly every time he <laughs> one statement at a time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so during this uh, during this uh, hearing. Uh, Christine Milne, the, the Greens leader, asked Tony King, the representative from Apple, the CEO of Apple in fact, what is a double Irish sandwich with a Dutch affiliation? So panel, what is a double Irish sandwich with a Dutch affiliation, Nick? Uh, I have an answer, but it would get cut out, so I'm just going to step out of this one. Okay, and uh, Rob? Well, this reminds me of iridology, which is the, uh, as you know, the study of the eyes, which yeah. is that if you look in someone's eye, you'll be able to tell their health. And uh, I think that was, oh God, who was it? It was Ignaz von Pazilli, I was the guy who discovered that. And uh, he discovered this, if you don't know the, the, uh, the history of iridology, he discovered this when he accidentally broke his owl's leg and then noticed a new mark in his eye. Which uh, I think is a, there's a lot of warnings in that. <laughs> Don't trust a man who's, who's you know caught an owl. Don't trust a man who accidentally breaks its leg. Yeah. And. Don't trust a man who knows the eyes of his owl so well that he knows any new mark in it. So I'm presuming it may well be something involving uh, eye uh, identification. Eye identification. Yeah. I like that. I like that. And I certainly like the preamble to the answer. It's fantastic. And, uh, and Ross? Well, I'm less interested in the sandwich and more interested in what kind of appliance it was cooked in. Because that's, there's, a certain, that's true. there's a certain oven which I would prefer the sandwich wasn't cooked in, um, for obvious reasons. <laughs> And I think to me, the Milne missed the obvious and most important question in this equation. Yeah, which was? Which oven was yes. it cooked in? Was it yeah. cooked in a Dutch oven? Yes, yes. No, we, we, we yeah. got it. Yeah. 
Yeah, a very, a very sweet people feeling. work for that, but thanks for that. <laughs> that was great. No <laughs> so, uh, it's a, a, a double Irish sandwich with a Dutch affiliation is actually a tax avoidance technique employed by certain large corporations involving the use of a combination of Irish and Dutch subsidiary companies to shift profits to low or no tax jurisdictions. Yeah, we actually, uh, I've come across that recently, so um, the, the, uh, the Brisbane Skeptics are putting on the, the, uh, the Australian National Skeptics Convention very soon, and because of that we started thinking about marketing, you know, yes. uh, and I, I thought, you know, let's, let's pay Facebook a small amount of money uh, to, to boost a post. And uh, it, it turns out that when you, when you pay through PayPal, uh, you're actually paying Facebook Island Limited, which wow. was... Uh, not too surprising, but I, I was, it was curious to sort of find that out, actually. At the Is that a self-contained island within San Francisco, the Silicon Valley? Uh, it's actually the one where you get the, the rainbow whopper that the, um, Brian Fisher likes to talk about so much. <laughs> From Des Moines, Iowa, by the way. Des Moines. <laughs> Facebook Island is such a beautiful image, just Jesus. filled with people in a constant state of maybe. <laughs> I would like to add that the reason that she was upset is because they were using this dodgy system of avoiding paying taxes instead of the honest system that Murdoch used by buying the government. So, <laughs> well, that works too. I mean, I, I imagine Facebook Island is actually um, this place where people have been accidentally preserved, something like in Doctor Who, but they're all mid selfie with the stick and they're all just looking at the sky, you know, Brian Cox like. But instead, you know, it's just the selfie stick and the phone is, you know, it's slowly dying and it's all sad and then the battery runs out and then they all die. Yeah, very, very sad. So next up, several Australian cities recently hosted a protest called Reclaim Australia, as we recently discussed, where a bunch of Australians protested the wearings of the wearing of burqas because uh, they make you anonymous and they obscure your speech and uh, other social cues, uh, cues rather, and uh, or at least that's what I think that they were protesting. It was really hard to understand them because their faces were obscured by some type of flag with some stars on it. Uh, sorry, bad joke. So. Uh, no, it was satire. Yeah, There's nothing was. wrong with getting satire. Yes. And I'll tell you what, in the edit, that's going to be fine. fine. It is like satire. you say, you idiots. <laughs> <laughs> Comedy's never worked live. It's always edited. <laughs> <laughs> so guys, nonetheless, the organiser of these xenophobic protests, Pastor Danny Nalaya, the, uh, the, head, the head of Catch the Fire Ministries, he had an, incredible, uh, an incredibly catchy cheer for the day. He shouted, one, two, three, four, we don't want Sharia law. Five, six, seven, eight. We don't want blank. Panel, <laughs> finish that cheer. Ross, five, six, seven, eight. We don't want blank. Well, I think uh, what they should be saying is we don't want to be associated with hate, which they're clearly failing at miserably. Um, I don't know. Maybe, you know, five, six, seven, eight. We all need to close the gates. Yes, is, that's good. Good little yeah, you know, uh, tie, tie into uh, the the uh, the CSG protest. Well, what they actually need is they, they need uh, around the, the, the sort of the border of Australia. What they need to do is make it out of elastic. Uh, and what they need to do is point the elastic in such a way that as the asylum seekers come in, they can just be bound straight to the room and save us even more money. Yeah, yeah. They kind of do that though with the uh, massive carriers. Uh, floating around the top end, pushing people back or pulling them back rather. So Nick, five, six, seven, eight, blank. Uh, we don't want to, and then he said a word that uh, by necessity you have to do on your own, and it's a thing that you enjoy very, very much. Um, <laughs> masticate. Masticate. Yeah, masticate. Yeah. That's what it was, yeah. Is that, a, is that a hint? I know I know this isn't the most professional thing, but come on. I've been working all day, we've been setting up for hours. It's not all about you, Ross. So, uh, Rob, catch the fire. Catch the fire. Are yeah. they really jugglers? Yes. Are they people, jugglers, who are hiding their juggling shame by instead pretending to be fundamentalists? Yes. Um, I presume it's, uh, we don't want You're My Mate by Right Said Fred to be considered <laughs> to be a national anthem for this country. <laughs> it was only a hit in this country, by the way. It didn't do so well in the UK. You are so... Am right Said Fred still big here, or has that not really carried on? They I mean, they were. No, they're still huge. Oh, good. They're on down the road. 
So oh, that's that's right. Right. Yeah. doing the world tour right. 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 That's uh, <laughs> that's one of those references that shows your age there. So. <laughs> <laughs> and mine, unfortunately. I'm just so, a messenger. <laughs> so, uh, so unfortunately, all your guys, uh, your answers all rhymed, and um, Danny didn't. Oh, oh, oh sure. we'll see. It went one, two, three, four. We don't want Shariah Law. Five, six, seven, eight. We don't want halal meat. <laughs> <laughs> a friend of mine uh, in the US set up a game, a massive nerf game of humans versus zombies. Basically, half the team was zombies, half the team was, was humans running around his university, University of Florida, shooting each other, and they had big rallies for the humans and the zombies. If the zombies got you, you put on a green headband, you were a zombie from then forwards, kept going until it was over. And uh, he showed me this footage of the zombie cheer, and the zombies were there. What do we want? Brains! When do we want them? Brains! <laughs> Actually, one of my uh, one of my favourite Bill Bailey jokes is um, for some reason he's not a big Lionel Richie fan, and uh, I saw one of his uh, stand-up gigs, and uh, he was talking about halal meat, and uh, he, he likes to obviously Bill Bailey likes to sing. One of the best things I've heard from him was um, halal. Is it meat you're looking for? Yeah. <laughs> So uh, yeah, this this was such an unfortunate uh, event, of course. Uh, but you know, on the bright side, we do know that Danny the Liar can count to eight. So he's got that going for him. So next up, Liberal Democratic Senator David Lionhill, the uh, senator who appeals to young people despite his age, because just like those young people's uh, 18-year-old weed dealers, he's also a libertarian. Uh, so he said this week that quote Australians who don't have children are being increasingly taxed to support the choices of others. Panel, what was, this, what was Senator Lionel referring to when he said that Australians are being taxed to support the choices of others? Nick? Uh, well, you already, you already said it. They're actually being charged just a little bit more for each of their wee bags, and, uh, and that's going towards, you know, straight towards the younger people's uh, you know, their usage so that they can, uh, they can afford to smoke a little bit more, which, you know, not necessarily a bad thing, but also, you know, a little bit unfair. Yeah, big markup on those weed bags. Oh, definitely. Yeah, the, the weed of one is, by the way. That's, uh, that's what I'm talking about. And, and you inject them or something? Yeah, oh, no, you snort lines of weed of one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Weed of one. Yeah, weed of one, but you inject uh, cannabinol, so, you know, you just gotta be careful. Into your eyeballs or something? Uh, yeah, we'll say that. <laughs> Not different to a ball stick, but anyway. Okay. And so, Robert? Do you know what? what? What comes out of your mouth is so different to your bow time. <laughs> <laughs> References to 1950s jazz band. Very different, isn't it? Let us talk about Dostoevsky. The, uh, the, uh, right, so, uh, what was the question? Who is this man? I've never heard of any of these David things. Lionel. What am I doing here? <laughs> Good question. Excellent <laughs> question. So, uh, David Lionel is a, uh, he's a Liberal Democratic Senator. He's uh, basically won all by himself in the Senate, and he said, he said, that uh, Australians who don't have children are being increasingly taxed to support the choices of others. So what choices of others are Australians being taxed to support? Is it about an old woman who lives in a shoe? Yes. Because she has got a lot of children. She does. And, uh, or is it about the cannibalising of people who deliberately have children to then turn them into different forms of meat on the Gold Coast? Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> If it's about people who deliberately have children to offer them to uh, the cast of Scooby-Doo or any possible fourth Matrix film that is made within this area, yes, am I anywhere near no, the correct you, answer? Every the single one of them is actually correct. Right, good, good. Yes, I, yeah. I only have one correction, and that's any meat that's unlabeled on the Gold Coast is an ibis. <laughs> <laughs> but it's allowed. <laughs> well, <laughs> no. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Ross. I think it's actually a tax on Game of Thrones because the only people paying for Game of Thrones are people without children who can download it for them. So what, by, by, by taxing Game of Thrones, what they're, what they're doing is actually funding all the kids who aren't, aren't paying for it and certainly aren't going to be you know, pursued by HBO in another vexatious lawsuit very soon. That's yeah. definitely not going to happen. You actually just reminded me to text my daughter to uh, download the... So, um, he was referring to the government support to help middle and low income families manage rising childcare costs and uh, propose the proposal to make it easier to access childcare places. Uh, he said, quote, a lot of people don't have children, he said. Uh, a lot of people have children who have grown up and moved on. 
he also said, uh, you wouldn't know by looking at me, but uh, I'm actually a grown-up child myself. So basically he was protesting, he was protesting that the government's changes, or uh, to be changes, uh, to the Australian tax system will include subsidies for childcare and he was very upset about the fact that all Australians are effectively subsidising the choices of parents to have children. Well don't you know the best way to ruin the economy is to essentially delete an entire industry and prevent people from going back to work? Yeah. Because then people pay tax you see and that's, that's an absolute disaster for the economy. <laughs> Put that whole tub in there. Yep. Right? And then you get the uh, the mince that you have to do up with uh, refried beans. Yep. And that's where you put the salsa in. Okay. The salsa doesn't actually go on top. Of I it actually regret top. asking you what the best kind of. I'll, I'll, I'll read the paper when it comes in. The salsa that goes on top is actually uh, chipotle sauce. So oh, that's that's the secret, guys. Enjoy. Oh, that's in Eric von Däniken's 1972 yes. book, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. About the visitation of aliens bringing yeah. spices and salsa. Yeah. yeah. If you haven't read it, it's gorgeous. Gorgeous. Yeah. gorgeous. Oh, it is important to know that the spice is life. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and it must flow. <laughs> And so, Ross, what did they find in their search of 100,000 galaxies? I think what they did is they looked at 100,000 galaxies and then they felt really stupid because they realised they didn't even have a control for intelligent life <laughs> uh, in the first place. Having, you know, given that Earth probably doesn't have much of it as it is. Yes. You know, everyone knows as a scientist that you need excellent controls before you start yep. any experiment. Yep. So they've wasted all the money. They should have. They should have defined or at least found some intelligent life first before. Flitting all over the galaxy with NASA billions, or probably a few dollars, knowing the government at the moment. But you know, they should have—they should have got their controls in order. Yeah, true, true, love it. So uh, no, they actually they found nothing, unfortunately. No evidence of advanced civilizations in their searches. Uh, quote: The idea behind our research is that if an entire galaxy had been colonized by an advanced space-faring civilization, the energy produced by that civilization's technologies would be detectable in mid-infrared wavelengths. Exactly the re radiation that uh, the WISE satellite that I discussed was designed to detect for other astronomical purposes, said the lead researcher. It's very... I really like the word, you lost faith in that, didn't you? Yeah. Oh, said the lead research. I just feel very was, sad. Yeah, there was play at the end, it was sad, it was kind of melancholy. Yeah, and, yeah. Well, I, look, I'm one of the many, you're probably one also, considering you've, uh, you're reading Carl Sagan at the moment, who would love to see evidence of, uh, of advanced civilizations way out there that perhaps didn't have ill intent. Uh, but we're probably more likely to see the exact opposite. Well, I think the worrying thing is that actually what will happen is all across the universe there are civilizations, uh, sentient, self aware civilizations but they will never coincide in their existence. Mm. And all that will ever happen is that there will be creatures that eventually manage to kind of hop from one place to another and find that, ah, they all died out here now. Mm. So that's uh, it's quite a melancholy yeah. thought, but probably also quite hopeful, because some of them may be the ones who want to eat us, like Stephen Hawking told us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but, but others of them could you know, upload their intelligences to sort of computers that'll go around the universe, sparking off life in different places and giving evolution a big old kick along the way, you know, for, for Von Homo erectus, for example, to land some sort of black oh, monolith style. Yeah, which will just give it a give it a nudge towards Homo habilis, you know, on, on its way towards humanity, so. Yeah, yeah. That, I wish I'd never brought up Eric from Dan. That was uh, uh, Arthur C. Clarke. <laughs> yes, thank you. Beautiful. So, uh, next up. Uh, last week, it came to the world's attention that a candidate for the upcoming British election in Bristol, John Langley, who is running for the UK Independence Party, UKIP, uh, is actually a blank. <laughs> Wanker. <laughs> oh, my ass is getting cut out for sure. And do you know what? It's probably the correct one as well. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, you keep are amazing. You you keep in. I don't know how much. They're, they're very similar. To, well, they're not like replaying Australia because they're, they're, they're kind of. They're, what's interesting about them is they're not a racist party. They're not a racist party. An entirely separate element of them, though. Turns out that a lot of the people who support them are racist. It's yes. nothing to do with them <laughs> as a party. And there was a woman on, there was this great documentary, if you can ever get hold of it, it's called Meet the U-Kippers. 
And you know when you just, if you run the press woman for, for UK in this particular area, all she does throughout the whole documentary is going, oh no, <laughs> well why has he said that? Oh God, right, all the way through. There's a bit where she's sitting with uh, this woman who's a local UK councillor and uh, she's having a cigarette and, and the woman goes, I'm not racist, I'm not racist at all. I mean, the people who run the post office and they're, they're Asian or, or something, I don't have a problem with them, but... I do have a problem with Negroes. <laughs> and you just go, this is not going to turn out well for the non-racist UKIP party, right? <laughs> and you can see the, the, the press woman going, why is she doing this? Why is she doing this? Right? Goes, I do have a problem, and, and I, it might, I don't know why, it might have been a past life. Yeah, then she goes on that way, it might be another life that I've had, that's why. But I do have uh, a problem, and if someone at a dinner party, if I was taken to a dinner party, and I was sat next to someone with negroid features, and at that point you just go, I, I don't believe, you know when you, you think about the universe you're in, you go, think, I think this is the parody universe. Yes. I think this is <laughs> not every, every universe, universe has a different genre, and we're in this one. And then of course the woman just walks out and just sees the press and go, I told her, why did she say that? And she's almost in tears. But yeah, you keep, are, are a quite remarkable group of not, uh, not of racist. racist. Yeah, it's horribly it, xenophobic. Well, some of them are quite specific. Uh, <laughs> Do you think the reason people vote for them is that the uh, the leader of the party has possibly the most English name possible? For yeah. Nigel Farage. Nigel Farage. Farage. It's just, you can't get, I mean, Nigel for a start, I mean, yeah. he was definitely born <laughs> in, in a certain decade, right? Yeah. But just the name Farage, it's just... I do it uh, do, do you think it's possible to be too specifically racist though? Like, where are you from? Oh, well actually I'm half Mongolian, half Mexican. Go back to Mexicolia, you dickhead! <laughs> yes. I'm just going to go with no. <laughs> yes, it's the answer. <laughs> so, uh, panel, well, let me read the question again, just uh, so that we can get the context. So, uh, last we captured the world's attention that a candidate for the upcoming British election in Bristol, John, by the name of John Langley, who is running for the UK Independence Party, is actually a blank. So, panel, what was unique about this UKIP candidate? Ross? You know, I would, I would absolutely love, this would be perfect, I mean, if he was actually Polish. Just, it turned out secretly he's Polish, and that, you know, for that very reason, he needs to be expelled instantly from UKIP. Because that's, that's really, I think oh, that's like top of the sin pile for yeah. him, isn't it, being Polish? There's a great, have you seen the thing that there's uh, an ex, I, I, don't, I don't know, he's, he's a Polish nobleman who lives in England, who's challenged Nigel Farage to a duel. <laughs> <laughs> I would like him to be a Polish black and white minstrel because that would just be so much on a UKIP confusion name. Oh, I love it. I love it. And Nick? Uh, he's a massive Jeremy Clarkson fan. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, that's not unlikely, is yes. it? <laughs> he's the man who deliberately makes Jeremy Clarkson's meat cold because he enjoys rage. <laughs> I know what it is. It's, he was, uh, can I say? Yeah, please. He, he's in porn films. <laughs> but if I showed you an image of him and said, oh, 25 yes. guesses, you wouldn't say that. <laughs> but would, would, would you say that about Ron Jeremy, for example? A lot more than a bloke who... Yeah, it depends what... He part, doesn't even look like what the bloke who's to like, like, yes. mend your boiler. He looks like a <laughs> bloke who has to hold the bag. So this, guy looks, right? this guy looks like the Crypt Keeper. Oh, yeah. No. He looks like... The, but that, that, funnily enough, this isn't actually the controversial part of it. The, uh, the controversial part of it is actually that this guy has brought over several Hungarian and Polish immigrants to hey. star in his pop porn films. Uh, did you hear, um, there was a story recently where um, a bunch of, uh, I think this was in Australia, where uh, Peppa Pig is filmed on a, a steam train, uh, uh, right, and um, a bunch of mothers were very concerned that a couple of weeks earlier, and I actually don't know if this is true, because this story was published on April 1st, so it could be a complete fabrication. I, I really hope it's true, but it turns out that uh, just a couple of weeks before these kids went to visit the, the train as uh, a school outing, that uh, the, the porn company Brazers had rented the train as a set for their um, movie and uh, the, the parents were quite upset that their kids were going to basically be in the same place that sex had occurred and it occurred to me that essentially if that was the case you could never Don't play in the house then. yeah you could never have your kids <laughs> inside the house i mean legitimately those kids came from somewhere where sex happened so oh, exactly <laughs> And, you know, if you haven't christened every... Well, I won't get into that, but, you know... <laughs> Presumably, though, they did clean the train. Well, yeah, I mean, one would think. <laughs> or hope. 
So I was worried you were going to reveal that Peppa Pig's parents have been involved in pornography. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he makes that noise, you know. It's just actually, that, that, I'm that, relieved that, by that. That would be. Yeah, that the would younger be. pigs were sent away from the animation depot, but then the older pigs were little to do. Well, that's a capitalist <laughs> episode that I would watch. Okay. <laughs> but that, that is seriously not allowed upon them. That is seriously not allowed upon well, them. So, uh, next up, scientists at the University of Alberta, Canada. There you go, the scientists at. Uh, University of Alberta. Yeah, they have scientists. I know it's hard to believe, Jake, but Canada yeah. is a real country. <laughs> so uh, they've been, quote, pulling people's fingers <laughs> for science for the last year to determine blank. So, panel, why have these scientists been pulling people's fingers for science? Robert? Oh, well, that's, is that something to do with uh, the lengthening of, because isn't it something about intelligence and the, the, the yeah. disparity in the, so finding out if you do actually stretch people's fingers, does that have an effect on their neurons? Is it, uh, is it anything to do with that? No. I would like it to be though, and I don't know why they're not investigating that. Currently. Yeah, well you should speak to them. Is it because they're the trying to find out if one of them is secretly E.T. Yes. And <laughs> it's only by putting, ah, yes. you're not from round here, and then suddenly <laughs> you keep arriving out there to go, these extraterrestrials coming over here. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's to see if it does actually increase the volume of your flatulence. Yes. Thank you. And, <laughs> and uh, Ross? Are they looking for something new that they can spam people's email boxes with? Yes. Actual spam. You don't get it, do you? No. Okay. Explain. I'm not, you see, you've got a clean podcast. There, there was one time. I could have just said what I meant, but now I can't do that. Mr. I need a clean tag on my podcast. Oh, no, it's Even though there's a plenty of out themes in oh, it. Oh, that's a disaster. I said, fuck her. I did I? And he is. And that's against British rules. When I was out in the States, I kept doing these breakfast shows where they went, oh, by the way, you can swear. And I went, no, I can't. I've spent 24 years working for the BBC. And they go, it's live, it's live. And take the thing up to You know, that's. Uh, so, yeah. I'm really sorry for ruining the thing. <laughs> <laughs> As you said, it's all in post. It's all in post. It's all in post. So, uh, no, it was uh, to determine why nothing's crack. Ah. Which is actually not all that important, but there you go. What was it? Well, you can't leave the pain. Well, I will tell you why. So, as the finger is pulled, tension mounts in the knuckle. As the finger is pulled, tension mounts in the knuckle joint, and fluid rapidly accumulates. Showing up as a white spot on the MRI picture. Then the cavity suddenly opens, producing the pop, much like the way a suction cup being pulled off a window does, said the lead researcher. So the bubble remains for up to 20 minutes in the joint, making it impossible to crack the joint again until it goes away, or rather is absorbed back into the surrounding area. Uh, so there you go, despite old wives' tales, the ability to crack knuckles may be a sign of healthy joints, funnily enough, uh, the researchers said, and uh, therefore useful for monitoring joint health. I should say oh, though... You can. Can you? No, I, I, it's not something... No, my it's sternum not. will do it, weirdly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, like, come on, put the shirt off, let's have a go, come on. I can't. Pictures or it never happened. No, it, it, yeah, it takes yeah, it, like yeah, if yeah, I've been playing a lot of sport, I can, my sternum will crack, which is very I'll odd. I around the room a couple of times. I should. <laughs> I, should. I love that this is an audio, you know, it's, 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 it's great, but no, pretty much that on my knee occasionally. I think everyone has that, but yeah, my sternum, oddly, is, is the only real thing that cracks often on, on my body. So. Can, can I just tell you, as a, as a knuckle cracker myself, uh, everybody listening to this podcast right now will be cracking their Whoa. knuckles in response. That's good. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Oh, this is, this is great. great radio. I'm, I'm loving this. <laughs> See, I can't do anything because I've, I've also got really small thumbs, so I can't. Wow, I thumbs are tiny. Yeah, they're really, really small. They're really wow. small. Well, so they're not that small, but they're all stumpy. Mm. And uh, that means I can't click my fingers. They, yeah. they won't make the clicking sound, so oh. I'm not allowed to go to any. Can you play Xbox, though? Oh, I'm brilliant at that. I'm, I'm brilliant at any kind of boxing game or anything like that. I'm brilliant at texting, but I can't enjoy jazz. <laughs> <laughs> or, or beat poetry for that matter. Yeah. Oh, the Not, a Fos- Alan Ginsburg. <laughs> <laughs> Not a Fosse fan then. So I should say that actually the uh, the sample size of this was actually N equals one. So uh, <laughs> perhaps you ca- and no, are you serious? Like yeah. they, they tested one person. My, my yes, little but. brother told me about this story. Yeah. He told me that a man won the Nobel Peace Prize for cracking the knuckles on his left hand 
every day, but not on his right hand for 25 years. <laughs> and I, I asked him one question. I said, do you have Google in your house? <laughs> But uh, I should say, actually, this uh, the, the gentleman that um, that wrote this article, rather the, the gentleman, the n equals one, the sample, uh, was a chiropractor, and he was oh, known as, as the most crackable man in Calgary. See, you just you've it. just ruined the whole thing now. I can't take anything that you say <laughs> seriously. Well, he was the, he was the study sample, so he he wasn't actually controlling the study. He was just cracking his knuckles for science, which is pretty cool. And he may or may not have won the Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah, Peace Prize. What he said. <laughs> oh, the most the, the, crackable man in Calgary. Yeah. Well, <laughs> didn't imagine really being second. Imagine being the Buzz Aldrin. Pretty sure that's, that's a nut in a crack. So that's, that's the only other the question. Wasn't Calgary. there the mayor of Alberta who recently was a rather, you know, prolific crack addict also? Yeah. Yeah. Hello, oh, Rob Ford. Rob Ford. Yeah. Right. Toronto. Toronto. Yeah. Toronto. There you go. I was pretty close. <laughs> well done, Brisbane's very good on keeping up to date on drug news. <laughs> <laughs> it's important. I think the important thing was it was the first time it was done in an MRI machine, so they could actually see the popping occur. And yeah, for functional MRI, I should and say as well. The creation of the bubble, not the popping of the bubble, that caused the crack. Ah, very cool. Actually, a, a this is brilliant. <laughs> this, no, this, why aren't the mics out there? This is what they should be. This is from a footnotes audience. Yes, this is a footnotes audience. Absolutely. Something would just be passive, but no way. <laughs> Once you started, everything's turned now. You know, there's been a few other areas. Yes. This, this is good. You guys are the most helpful hecklers that I've ever seen. <laughs> Straight in that way. Come along yeah. these gigs. Not heckling, just educating. <laughs> Fair enough. Nick, that. He didn't win the Nobel Peace Prize, but that guy really does exist. Yeah, the, yes. the left knuckle cracker. I think we turned into QI. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's IQ. That's family feud. <laughs> You're doing the wrong thing. So, guys, uh, scientists from University of Illinois in uh, Urbana Champaign have found a signal in the brain that suggests that young children's belief in blank has a basis in biology. So panel, what has this discovery given credence to, Nick? Uh, scary things under the bed. Yes. Is that correct? No. Passive aggressive rhetoric? Yeah. No. Okay, not at all. Tooth, Tooth fairy. Tooth fairy? Ooh. So an actual basis in biology? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love that the, they did some experiments a while back where they put karma like nuns into fMRIs too, but I, they, they had a volunteer, you know, and then they put a Carmelite nun in, and, uh, and they had to think of godly thought to find out if there was kind of god area of the brain. I just love that bit going, just the, the luring the nuns, it's great. Yeah. It, I remember reading a, a similar study where, unfortunately for them anyway, the imagination center, or the creativity center of the brain lit up rather than you know, an actual signal sending. Well, I like the idea of the being, because, you know, as far as I know, I might be wrong about this, and I'm ready for everyone to put their hands up and you know, give the kind of addendum, but the, the idea that there is a God spot of the brain, mm. and, and God had kind of made it different sizes, because he didn't want everyone to be kind of really needy. So it was like, well, I want some people to blindly worship me, but I'd like some people with a level of doubt, because, you know, it's nice to just have to work a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it is kind of emasculating, though, because in that uh, story, we would, of course, have the smallest yeah. god part, god, god part of the I, I mean, he could have put that in solely because he wanted Thomas to finger his hand holes. Yeah. <laughs> Good old daddy Thomas. Yes. And Ross? Everything their parents tell them is true. Yes, has a basis in biology. Because, you know, look, Timmy, if you go into the savannah, you are going to get eaten by a lion. And it did happen. I think it more has more to do with needing to do your homework, doesn't it? I mean, I actually, as a kid, I was, I was one that just never did my homework. You know, I, for some reason, I, I got away with it. You know, teachers just failed to punish me, and that set an, you know, unfortunate precedent, probably. But you know, it, it, it is a requisite of being a human being that you have to lie to your kids to, yeah. to keep them under control. So I'll never tell your kids that you didn't do your homework, bro. No, that's <laughs> that, that would be a terrible mistake. Yes. I, I remember when I figured out that my parents were full of bullshit when my dad told me that I had to eat the sandwich, uh, the crusts on my sandwiches or else I wouldn't get curly hair. And I said, well, I don't want curly hair. And he said, oh, well, then if you don't eat them, you, w you will get them. <laughs> and I was like, you don't know. You don't know. You're talking bullshit. <laughs> my dad told me that all blue food was poisonous. 
And I still believe it. <laughs> you know, I was quite gorgeous looking, isn't it? But it's, it, there's a lovely bit of the disparity in height. I mean, that's where you see, obviously, where, where there's going to be a change, where, you know, your children, when, when you are a giant, for a while you're a giant, and at that point they have to look up to you, and you instruct them, and then when they get to teenager, and then once the eyes meet, then you realise they don't really care. No, they can take. And then, when if you get really old, you start shrinking. Yes. So it's really <laughs> awful that yes. happen. But eventually they'll be able to carry you to bed. Yeah. <laughs> I've actually been taller than my father since about the age of twelve. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's 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 it's, it's a weird. Does he ask you yeah. carry can carry you to bed? He might ask. I don't think I could do it. <laughs> I've been the same, but I've also had a more glorious beard than my dad since I was grade three. So <laughs> grade three, I love it. So uh, actually, no, they found that cooties exist. Cooties. So scientists have found a signal in the brain that reflects young children's aversion to members of the opposite sex, the, quote, cooties effect. And also their growing interest in opposite sex peers as they enter puberty. It's the same area of the brain, basically. So these two responses to uh, members of the opposite sex are encoded in the amygdala. Uh, the researchers report the findings challenge traditional notions about the role of the amygdala. Uh, the team evaluated 93 children's attitudes towards same-sex and opposite-sex peers using functional MRI, which tracks the oxygenated blood flow in the brain. Uh, so the researchers also analyze the activity in 52 children. So it equals 52. Uh, so guys, finally, final story of the night. Final story of the night. I want you to say amygdala again. It's really good. Amygdala. Yeah, it's good. It's like when you, the first time you actually say neurofibromatosis, and you think, I can say that now. How can I keep getting that into sentences? It's really hard. I like bovine spongy form encephalopathy. Oh, that's yeah, but you good. really don't like uh, traditionally feminine facial features. That's true. I can't say that one, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, guys, medical experts from the London University re-examined the symptoms experienced by Roman Emperor Julius Caesar in the latter part of his reign, around 44 BCE, and determined that the most likely cause of his dark moods and other varied symptoms was blank. So panel, what does this team of medical experts diagnose long dead Emperor Julius Caesar as causing his dark moods and other various symptoms? Ross? Did One Direction invent the time machine and not tell anyone? <laughs> and suddenly I understand all of history. Yeah. <laughs> Nick? Uh, well, I was always raised being taught that it was epilepsy, but now that I think about it, uh, that Cleopatra was pretty popular and the aristocracy for many, many years had been spreading syphilis. So was it syphilitic madness? <laughs> Did you wear a lot of I love that. When you mentioned Family Feud, if I ever see that show and they go, is it syphilitic madness? <laughs> Let's have a look. <laughs> That's the top answer. <laughs> 53. Uh, uh, so, um, is it um, asp envy? That's what I think it might be. Think of the clear patch. They were like different levels of kind of snake size, and I, I realised we were there was kind of pre-Freudian age, but nevertheless, that could have been it. Yeah, I like it. Well, well, he did. He did yeah. call Mark Antony an asp when he stole his girlfriend. So, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, Roman Emperor Julius Caesar may have suffered a series of mini strokes explaining the dark, or his dark mood in Did late. you say knee strokes or wee strokes? Mini strokes. Mini strokes. He had some wee strokes, you know? I just thought you were going a bit Scottish on us, which it's is weird, weird taking your Italian it, heritage. If, if I were to say that though, Jake, it'd be cut out as a sex joke, so, you know, <laughs> thanks for the hypocrisy. I think <laughs> you are such a, I, I, look, you, you're a scabrous individual, because <laughs> the fact that by never saying what's in your mind, you're really referring to it, anyone listening to this now has ended up finding themselves in a horrible kind of dank <laughs> corner made of their own peccadillo. <laughs> 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 That moustache oh. makes me believe in Victorian <laughs> science of physiognomy. <laughs> Actually, my phrenologist said that that's wrong. <laughs> so, uh, Caesar, who lived from 144 BC, has long been the focus of medical debate, with the common assumption being that he suffered from epilepsy, as uh, Nick said. Uh, but medical experts from Le the London University have re-examined his symptoms which included vertigo, dizziness, and limb weakness, and concluded that he may have in fact suffered from a cardiovascular complaint. So how about that? Here's a question for you. What, what's your favorite mysterious death through history? Because Caesar's is quite 
you know, it's quite good. But I, I've always been a fan of Tycho Brahe myself. Oh, and, yes. and, you know, the circumstances around his death. Well, the, the cool thing about uh, Tycho, if, if you want to pronounce it that way, uh, is, is that they've exhumed him fairly recently, in fact. Just a couple of check his bladder. Less than a year. Well, it wasn't the bladder. They were checking his hair, so... For anyway, oh, yes, was, it, was it mercury? Uh, no, it was... Um, oh, it could be mercury. It was, I think it might have been arsenic, but the, the, the story behind him is, is that Tycho Brahe was a, a bit of a maverick scientist back in the day. Uh, and he, he, he was a real badass. Like he, he had a golden nose because he had a disagreement about a mathematic problem, and he got into a duel with a fellow mathematician and had his nose shot off. So he fashioned one out of gold. So he had a, he had a golden nose. Uh, and the nose in the coffin, when they dug, dug him up, was apparently a bronze nose. It was supposed to Yeah, that wasn't his nose, was it? If you're wearing someone with a golden nose and you're oh, yeah. a grave digger, which is not good rates, <laughs> no. you're going to swap noses, aren't you? Yeah. You're going to find the cheapest nose you've got hanging around the house. Because <laughs> we all have them. We all have them yeah. as backup. Right. Every grave digger. We've got our secondary or yeah. you know, third, third. Grave diggers actually had a drawer. That's what people do. That's not common knowledge, but grave diggers had a drawer of spare noses and, and for some reason, little fingers. Who knows why? Uh, because they like taking their work home with them, obviously. <laughs> But uh, and so the, essentially, there, there was a there was a somewhat rivalry between Brahe and uh, Kepler, who obviously he he's the one who derived the laws of planetary motion based on Brahe's data. And, uh, it, it, it's thought that um, Kepler was very jealous of the data, and he, he, he you know he wanted it, which um, Brahe would never give him while he was alive. And the, the idea was that essentially Kepler was poisoning Brahe, you know, with arsenic or some kind of heavy metal. Uh, but it, 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 it does turn out that Brahe died because he, was, he felt it so rude to leave the dinner table at a party that his bladder literally exploded. And that's how he died. I mean, that, that for me is, he's one of the most badass people in history. I mean, not only did he look at the sky every day. But he held it for like three hours. Yeah, you know, I mean, that, that's pretty badass. You know, if, you, <laughs> if you're going to duel someone over a mathematic equation and let your bladder burst, you know, lest you be perceived as rude. <laughs> I mean, that to me is the ultimate in, in sort of, I mean, and this guy's a scientist, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't Lord Byron or some, you know, someone like that. He was, he was a scientist, but he was eccentric, and that just to me is one of the coolest things ever. I, I mean, he was alive at the time of syphilitic madness, though, so any of his decisions are probably a little bit questionable. Yeah. That's, that's, Especially if a man... We asked 100 members <laughs> of the public what they know about Tycho Brahe. <laughs> This is the final series of Family Feud. Apparently we've gone into a demographic area which has alienated many of the You know, of course, you know all about the elk as well, don't you? Oh, the elk. Uh, yeah, yeah, the great thing, yeah, you had, had, had a pet elk that uh, died when he got it drunk and it fell down. <laughs> <laughs> which is just fantastic. You don't see that in astronomy as much anymore. We don't see that elk at all. We, I mean, you don't see enough elk, but in, in, in people's homes especially. I, I would pay to go to Chatsworth and see an elk inside the building. That would be fabulous. It would be, yeah. That's a limited joke in the wrongs people here, I, I, I now realise. But it's... I'm sure there's one listener out there, Ross, and if, if, if you're on that listener, please tweet Ross. Ross <laughs> uh, at, at Ross Fox, yeah, thank you. Or Chris welcome. welcome. Yeah. Uh, if you're into Mr. Darcy and the, the kind of Jane Austen, though, Chatsworth is, is, is where he was supposed to have lived, so that's, that's an extra piece of unwanted information. <laughs> that will be cut, no, I'm just kidding. This show's really changed. Around the last few minutes, you've suddenly packed it full of information, and I've realised all the potential that was there at the beginning, but it's too late now. Because <laughs> <laughs> Jake, just, Jake just doesn't know enough about anything to be educational, so I have to fill the void in Absolutely. a very unfunny, but still, still somewhat entertaining manner. And, 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 and I, with my dick jokes, also try to fill the void. Oh, And that, my dear friends, my dear sceptically inclined, secular sides loving ninjas, is all that we have here. That, the, I like the ninjas this time, Robin. So, uh, the Are you trying one? to close the show, Jake? Yes, I am indeed. Sorry, I actually yeah. have a mouthful of food. This is doubly bad for, it is for radio. You can hear the chewing and... Well, firstly, you, you should never over uh, talk over the host. That's no. second. But having food in your mouth at the same time is probably also frowned upon. I actually encourage people to talk over the host when I'm recording, because generally the, uh, the, the panellists are smarter than I am. Uh, and also, you've got the control deck, so you just hit, you know, stop recording <laughs> on that. Mute. Mute. Yes, indeed. So that's all that we have for you for this special episode of the Imaginary Friends Show Don't Go Poke Case. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Really greatly appreciate you for coming out, and certainly appreciate uh, both the AFA and indeed Robert Ids for being on the panel this week. You two other guys. And... 
what he's saying is we can fuck right off. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, this evening, Robin. Um, and you've, of course, got your, your live show uh, tomorrow night, uh, the Magic of Science, the... Ha yeah, yeah, yeah. Happiness that, that through might Science. That the Happiness through the Science. The evening, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel a tremendous sense of respect for you there. Uh, I mean, no, it was three words to learn, you know, so there's no way to manage that. But, uh, yeah, I'll be doing science, bang, bang, pop, rock tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, but, but you know, I got it. Where is it? Eaton's Hotel. Not actually in Brisbane. You know, some yeah. some distance from Brisbane due to booking difficulties. Yeah, <laughs> which is you know nearly as good as uh, I'm playing Sydney on Anzac Day. So it turns out it's not <laughs> the best day to do a, uh, a, a, a skeptic-based uh, science fun show. But uh, well, we're certainly having some adventures. Yes. I think before we go, uh, a little recurring theme in, in the show is, is um,